maybe you can, for folks who maybe don't know as much about Motown, I don't know, like how, how did you become interested in Motown and what, what is Motown and, um, how, you know, what, what are some of the highlights from Motown history that I don't know that you're, that you're interested in? Yeah, I don't know that I'm an expert, but I, I'm happy to talk about Motown because it's music that I love. Um, I feel like it's such a staple of American culture now, uh, but it's very new to me. I knew some of the music growing up. And then when I moved to Detroit for the Detroit Symphony job about five years ago, I rediscovered all of this music and I've been listening to it ever since uh, and looking for ways to uh, incorporate that into the music that I make and not just the music that I listen to. Um, I think it's such a deeply rooted part of Detroit's history and culture. And so it just makes sense that being a musician that lives and works in Detroit, um, that we, I am trying to make a connection with the music of Motown. Um, I love this music. It's all really upbeat. And one of the coolest things about the Motown music is that it's not all about uh, love and relationships. There are a few, like, of course, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, but there's also some that have political statements. Um, there's some that are about poverty and uh, just so many different issues. And uh, it's, it's just such beautiful um, music as well. So one of the coolest things about Motown music is that a lot of the tracks have string and horn parts in the background. And these were recorded at the Motown studios in the 60s and 70s in Detroit. Um, and the backup tracks were played by musicians of the Detroit Symphony. Oh, wow. So after classical concerts in, on Saturday and Sunday nights, they, people would head over to the Motown studios just down the street from us and record with the Motown artists till 1 or 2 a.m. Mm. Um, every day. It, and of course, that was long before my time. Uh, but now I'm trying to just rebridge that gap um, and have a way for us to reinvigorate the music of Motown um, and the music and classical music at the same time. Yeah. It, speaking of the studios, is is I mean, is Motown is a. It, would you say it's like mostly? A style or, or the, the studio itself or a label, a record label or like all of the above or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is it is all three of those things. So Motown is a record label and it used to be a studio in Detroit on Grand Boulevard. That has been converted into the Motown Museum. Um, it was originally a house where I think Barry Gordy lived, the, one of the founders of Motown, and then the studio was attached. So now both of those buildings are part of the Motown Museum, which you can go and visit. It's really cool there because you can see uh, the studio, you can actually walk around in the studio and just get a feel for what it was like. But then there's so much memorabilia there from those artists like, um, they have one of Michael Jackson's gloves that he donated to the museum. Um, and then, you, of course, you can hear all their music. And they just um, they just reopened after the pandemic and had a grand reopening, um, I think, maybe a month ago. So the building there is cool and you can really see the roots where Motown started. I think the Motown label is now in Los Angeles. So after maybe 10 years in Detroit, they ended up moving down there. So some of the artists who had started with Motown, like Stevie Wonder, um, I think maybe he's not considered a Motown artist, but- Oh really? He, I thought he was. Um, he, I think he made his break with them and then maybe started his own label. Okay. Uh, but he also might have recorded with them a lot in LA. Mm -hmm. So there's big connections there. Mm -hmm. um, of course, for me, I'm always looking for the music that was written and recorded in Detroit. But I I, re I wrote some arrangements of Stevie Wonder's too, because his music wow. is just so amazing. I know, I know. Yeah. Oh, I want to I hear those. I want to hear those. Um, <laughs> um, so I noticed I, I was looking at, you know, your the part, uh, my, like mm -hmm. my part, and I noticed that 
um, there's sort of the instructions are pretty sparse. Like there's no like glissandi marks and very few accents. And I, I, I kind of really like that because it kind of forces us to listen to the original versions and, and sort of get it from that. But was that like a conscious, I mean, or, or, yeah. or, you know, is it meant to be played with fewer glissandi? I don't know. Like, no, I mean, I think even with my own compositions, I try to leave markings sparse because I think everybody has a different taste when they perform. Um, and I think it's important for performers to have their own autonomy. Um, of course, your group is just fantastic with playing all sorts of styles. So oh my God. <laughs> um, you, like you don't need markings to know how to play Motown music really well. Um, I do. I feel like I do. it's hard. <laughs> you know, it's hard to it's kind of hard to, in a way, to imitate the voice because it's, the voice is so arresting. Uh -huh. voice. And, and then when it, when you translate it into like a viola or a violin or mm -hmm. cello, it's, sometimes it doesn't quite have that, the same sort of like direct power. I feel, I don't know, like, like that's yeah. my challenge when I think about arranging, because I want to arrange some Elvis songs, but I feel like so much Ooh. of that is the quality of the voice. Right. Um, so when you play something like Eight No Mountain, like how do you, you know, how do you capture that essence, the essence of the human voice in your instrument? Yeah, that's a good question. And getting back to the idea of marking things, I think if there are too many markings, they can be taken so literally to the point where it just feels like you're playing a glissando because it's written whereas it's just so much more natural when somebody's singing that way. Right. So uh, for me, when I play these, I'm listening to the words and trying to fit in, like, how do the syllables work? How, how does the voice, how does somebody sing the melodies that are, are this way? There's just a sort of naturalness to the way that like a certain word is sung um, and if you, if you just, you know, a lot of what we play is just mimicry anyway. So if you're thinking of like mimicking the human voice, then, um, you're going to get a good product. Whereas if you're trying to think of how to do a glissando from one note to another, then it might just be, um, very mechanical. Right. Right. Um, maybe I, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit of, I saw on your website that uh, your project, um, providing people with the, the quartet music by classical black composers and, and project. And, yeah. um, and how did you like come across those manuscripts? Are they all already online? That's a great question. So all of the ones I have so far are available online, but they are, and they're not readable. Um, they're, PDFs that maybe have been scanned very poorly and uh, some of them were lacking scores. They would only have parts. Um, one of the ones that I ended up arranging for string quartet had only a harpsichord part and it just had the A theme and the B theme and then that was it. And people were just supposed to know like um, in a traditional sense, you would do variations on those themes and you would have any number of players playing it so I took that and turned it into a set of variations. Um, but a lot of the, the music on my website by black composers is um, either a transcription of something like that or a string quartet that might've been in unreadable shape. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that project I started during the pandemic and it's really just a beginning. There's 33 pieces on the website right now that I've taken. A lot of them were on IMSLP and were available. Um, but like I said, we're in bad shape. But there's so much more music out there that is uh, in a library. Um, some of them are behind these, um, these reference walls where you can go to a library and you can view them, but you're not allowed to scan them. And I think it's a little bit sad, but I'm... I'm hoping that I can generate enough interest by starting this project that people will want to continue it and start to take that music and actually get it performed and re-notated so that other people can perform it. Because 
yes, it is very historic. It has a lot of historical value and therefore maybe a library is a good place for it, but there's no reason for it to be behind a wall like that where nobody can play it. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, I think it's a project that's very open-ended. Um, and I know I'm not the only person doing this. So of course, Rachel Barton Pine has some great resources out there. Um, a lot of the arrangements she's done are violin or violin and piano or violin and orchestra. So I picked string quartet because that's an area where I, I know it really well. And I feel like people are always looking for um, music for string quartet. Um Speaking of like arranging and also just composing, um, straight up composing, um, are you, I, sorry, I should know this, but are you self-taught? Did you study com um, composing? I did, or is yeah. A great train going by? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my piano teacher when I was growing up required us to take composition in addition to piano. So that's when I started and I majored in composition in college in addition to cello. Um, I studied with Paul Schoenfeld. So if you know cafe music, um, yeah. Oh, I did not know you studied with him. That's yeah. So cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, I feel so lucky. He's like this incredible legend and I don't think he's had a lot of students. Wow. Um, he was only in the U in at U of M for maybe five or six years. Um, so I hit him during that window and he was just such a great resource. Like a lot of composers, I feel like they're concerned with the um, the output of a product. Like when you think of the the great faculty at U of M, like Michael Doherty and, or maybe like a film composer or something, it's all about what the audience is hearing. Um, but with Schoenfeld, there was this technical aspect about focusing on form and figuring out how to like generate the music. Um, and I feel like both of those are very important, but a lot of people don't, you don't get that that front end, edu I guess it's back end, that back end education, so. Was it hard to get into his studio? Or is that like, were you one of the chosen few? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. I mean, at U of M, like they, the faculty rotate and you can kind of pick and choose who you want. And I really wanted him. And a lot of, there were a lot of big names that other people wanted. So it was just a good fit. He's, he was also a mathematician and I studied math. So I, um, he would give me like math problems during my composition lessons to go home and try. Yeah, I mean, how do you sort of start by sort of just doodling or improvising on, on your cello or, or, you know, like what are some of the things that you, cool things that you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the, you know, writer's block is something that everyone struggles with. Um, but what I usually start with are building blocks. So finding small motives that can turn into a large piece. Um, if I'm writing a piece for strings, I'll probably fiddle around on my cello a little bit. Um, uh, like for instance, this year I'm writing a concerto for my sister and myself. Um, my sister's a blue bluegrass fiddler in Arkansas. And so we're going to play with the youth orchestra next year, this double fiddle concerto. Uh, so a lot of the, the music that has to go into that needs to be very idiomatic and um, fiddle style. So it just makes sense to like fiddle around on the cello, mess around on the, my violin that I have upstairs um, and just find things that work well for the instrument. You play so, the violin? <laughs> I, I grew up learning violin. I don't, I hardly touch it except when I need to for composing. I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. cool. Um, I was, yeah, speaking of fiddling and bluegrass, I was listening to your, is it the fiddle trio? That yeah. You, that's online. Is that, um, are those, uh, like, act, what tunes do you reference in there or are those original tunes? I, I, I yeah, the, that, that, those are original. Um, but they're very similar to other fiddle tunes. So I actually heard an arrangement of a fiddle tune this summer that I was like, that sounds a lot like the fiddle trio that I wrote. Um, but yeah, they were original tunes. Do, do, would you say that um, fiddly 
tech, like bow, bow tech, bowing techniques and, and whatnot um, translate well onto the cello. I know the cello, many people, many cellists play, play fiddle tunes, but. Yeah, I would say it's really difficult to translate onto the cello because um, a lot of fiddle music, especially the bluegrass style, is built around being able to play fast or just move around your instrument quickly. Um, on cello, everything is two and a half times bigger than on violin. So uh, when I heard first heard Yo-Yo Ma playing Lime Rock with, um, with Mark O'Connor, I tried it on my cello. It's so difficult. And that's a tune that like I grew up with on the violin when I was in Arkansas. And then trying to play it on cello, I, I can't imagine. And then of course, Edgar Meyer playing some of those tunes on bass. He's insane. Like, it's so hard to do that. So um, yeah, like the shuffle style bowing on violin, that's something that is harder to do on cello. I think because like when you play this way, it's the opposite on cello. So your 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 elbow moves the opposite direction. Um, yeah. I, so so the the shuffle you're talking about, um, like for example, there's that I guess the shuffle that a lot of classical players think of um, in Orange Blossom Special, where it's like da 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 Exactly. Is that is that hard on cello? Because I it's super hard on cello. Really? Yeah. Oh no, because yeah. I because I wrote it for Debbie recently. <laughs> oh, she can handle anything. Okay. <laughs> She'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, but it yeah, it's just it's so weird to do it because it's reverse from what you do on violin. Like your elbow moves the opposite way. Yeah. Um, I I wanna um also at some point do you know um Bonaparte's Retreat? Oh yeah, yeah. It's old like fiddle tune. It's like mm -hmm. it's really super like rich in, 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 in its history. And mm -hmm. I, I tried a version recently where I tuned the violin, um, I think it's called Dead Man's Tuning, where it's like um, D, you know, so the G string is tuned down to a D, cool. and then D, A stay the same, and then the E is tuned down to a D. So it's like D, D, A, D. Whoa. <laughs> and I kind of want to like do that for the whole quartet, because how resonant would that be, right? Mm -hmm. But like, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the cello were to tune to all A's and D's, like, I don't even know if that would work. I think, yeah, you could do it. The low, the C string could go down to A. Oh, yeah. I don't think, I don't, I think maybe D would be too low on the G string, but you could leave the G string the same. Uh-huh. Because it's kind of a no-no to tune up for cello strings, I think. Yeah, I wouldn't tune up more than a half step. Yeah. So the right, so so all right. So D D and A you already have, and then G you would stay the same. Oh yeah. So you, yeah, yeah, you could try just the C string down. Yeah. I actually wrote a quartet where every instrument d has to detune. Awesome. Wait, detune to this to different st strings. Yeah, they're all tuned to different ones, and there's like an electronic track in the background, and then there is some like fiddle style shuffle bowing in it too. Wait, it's, this is for string quartet. Yeah, we yeah, I'll send you <laughs> I'll send you the music later. We have to play that. Wait, what is it called? Um, it's called uh Chrysalis Infinitum and it I wrote it in college. It's kind of an esoteric piece. Um, yeah, I mean the other, you know, challenge I think with detuning or like score to tour is like you, you know, like unless you have a spare instrument mm -hmm. right there like if you're playing the whole program like how does that work? Like, you know, like, <laughs> it takes some instrument forever to, uh, you know, adjust and then you're like... Yeah. Well, the fiddlers, they use that time to talk while oh, they're yeah. returning. Yeah. yeah. Last time Deborah was here at my house, we had this, um, this fun time just experimenting with the box suites because, uh, you know, one of the six box suites is detuned. Yes. And, and I actually play two of the other suites in the same tuning because I think it's more fun that way. And also like you can do half of, you can do three suites on one half of a program just in the same tuning and then retune back to normal. And so we were just trying every movement like with the A string tuned down to G just to see how it works. But, you know, but don't you get confused? <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it takes some work, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I, let's see. I. Um... 
I, I, I want to just th like, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I just want to thank you so much for all the help you've given me over the years. Like I owe you like 17 million dinners, you know? No, no. It's just, yeah, it's fun to work with you on these projects. And um, like, I love the Stefan Grappelli tunes to begin with. Aww. So I'm just so happy that somebody's doing something cool with them. Oh, and, and also <laughs> word on the street is that um, whenever you come to Chicago, you um, avoid contacting me, contacting me because you don't want to get roped into salsa dancing. Oh, or shoot. That. Yeah. Oh, that's a good <laughs> I should write and you I, next I time. I have to call you on that. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. No, I'll definitely write you. I, I come through a lot because um, it's kind of on the way home for me to Arkansas. So, Wait. and sometimes I have my dog with me. What's what? in Arkansas? My family lives in Arkansas. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I usually like stop overnight in Chicago. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> But, yeah. but I was like, what? Like, <laughs> he's like, oh, that would be so I'm, funny. I'm, I like, I'm not like that. <laughs> I've forgotten all of my salsa skills, but it would be fun to go out and try it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I haven't gone since the pandemic. I just, it just, it's kind of scary. I'm going to stop this recording just so mm -hmm. we can. <laughs>